live. All right. Well, with that, we're live. And before we actually got into the uh, discussion proper, which we're going to have in just a second, um, I want to go ahead and, and let everybody know what we're going to be talking about today. Mainly, it's going to be retro games that did or didn't stand the test of time. Um, obviously, this is a topic that some people are going to have uh, a, a few more horses in the race than others. And obviously, if a game is brought up that nobody else on the panel has talked about, then there's not really a huge discussion that can be had there. But uh, with that said, there was a game that we were thinking about, or a series at least, that was brought up right before we started in. So, Justin, I think you were the one that brought that up. Uh, were you referring to Chrono Trigger? Uh, Final Fantasy was what you brought up first. Oh, Final Fantasy the three, you. the old, the old school like Final Fantasy three for the Super Nintendo, which you said was actually Final Fantasy six. It's actually Final Fantasy six. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Final yeah. Fantasy three proper was on the NES. Uh, Square Enix didn't. Uh, Square Enix didn't think that Final Fantasy two, II, three, or five would be profitable in the United States, so they waited until Final Fantasy four came out to release that as two, and then when six came out, they released it here as three. And with a seven, it was just seven, and with eight, it was eight. Yeah, so with seven, with seven, they just gave up and just continued. Pretty much. <laughs> um, I would say that six has aged well in story. Kefka is probably the best Final Fantasy villain that's ever been conceived. Um, yeah. But in... Besides Sephiroth? I, I'm sorry, Kefka beats the crap out of Sephiroth as a villain. Absolutely. Yeah. Like for for Absolutely. one for one Kefka won. Like yeah. <laughs> let, let's let's boil Kefka's character down. He's the Joker who succeeds and wants to become God. Let's boil Sephiroth down. I have a big sword and I have a mommy complex. Go Genova. And he wanted to be a god also, but <laughs> yeah, but his method was a little different. Kefka's was I'm going to absorb all the magic in the world, and Sephiroth's was I'm going to make a big rocket the world. And Kefka, start, and Kefka started as a clown. He, he started out as a clown that somehow got a, a general's position in the army. <laughs> That's one thing that I never really understood. Like, I understand that, uh, that Kefka, as a character, deserves that slot. Because, I mean, if you're going to have an army that takes over the world, then he's probably your guy. Uh, considering that he was willing to poison an entire village without any, any conversation. He looks um, like a drag queen. But yeah. yeah, the question is, how would you let Kefka be a person in a in a military without any uniform, <laughs> any discipline, anything? And there's a sorceress, uh, Ultimicia, who mixed uh, who blended time together, past, present, and future. Yeah, but the problem with Ultimicia, yeah. the problem with Ultimicia, is that people for some reason just hate Final Fantasy VIII. Like, there's so. There's so much hate for the only thing in the Final Fantasy that, community. That, that, that's, that's only half the people who played it because they expected a sequel to Seven or something. Yeah, I think that the popularity yeah. of Final Fantasy Seven kind of overshadowed Eight. It was it was also the magic system in the With, game was garbage. Like I Eight is my favorite Final Fantasy game, but the magic system in Eight is utter garbage. Eight Eight's my all time favorite. Eight would have to be. Nostalgia. I don't hate it. I don't love it either. <laughs> Nostalgia purposes, I'd say 10's my favorite, but... Oh, yeah. Every time somebody says that 10 is their favorite, I only have this image of Titus doing his really cringy laugh at Sin. Oh, my God. You saw, you saw, <laughs> yeah. You saw, you saw <laughs> yeah, I hated, I hated Titus, and you, you saw, Waka was not much better. Ar Arn was a beast. Waka, oh, God, Waka. And, and yet, somehow, Waka got Lulu. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. We, we, so we, can all, we can all agree that Arn was fucking awesome. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But we kind of skipped over Final Fantasy IX. We went right to ten. Yeah, because they went back to its old roots. Nine wow. is nine is kind of a middle child in the final in like the, the Final Fantasy series. Like whereas eight is hated and panned amongst and, a lot of Final love. Fantasy it, fans. And people people are divided. it's a love hate game. The, the people you who either. love Final Fantasy Eight, it's their favorite. The people who yeah. hate Final Fantasy Eight think it's worse than Mystic Quest. Mm. But, oh, then, Mystic Quest the but then you've got Final Fantasy 7, which is almost universally praised, and then you've got Final Fantasy 9, which is almost universally not talked about. And you there's the, and there's <laughs> twelve's not talked about much, is it? No, not really. 12, I, like I never 12, liked 12. 12. And, I did not like 12. 12, unfortunately, I think 12 suffered from timing because around the time 12 came out, JRPGs had really fallen out of fashion. 
and it changed its combat system drastically when it got to 12 as well. And it was right off the heels of the MMORPG. So it and, was it was the, really and it was the transition spot. between PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3. Yes. Okay, which which um that, which Final Fantasy was the one with time. lightning in it and snow? That's 13, 13, that one. Oh, okay, was that's yeah, I didn't like that one. We also like all that Final Fantasy hallway. twelve. Final Fantasy twelve came out the Iris also <laughs> coming out at the same time. Which game? I know I'm Atelier Iris. I have no idea what or that at, is. At, at oh, you've never ah. heard of the Atelier games? No, that sounds like really niche. Real controversial. Oh, it's Dissidia. It's a really niche title. It is a really niche title. They're um basically alchemy games like mana out um mana, chemia, mana chemia. That's it. Does does Kingdom Hearts count as Final Fantasy because it's that and Disney also? I'd say they 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 do they do have uh some characters that showed up in uh. Kingdom Hearts. I can't remember I, who. Damn, it's, I love Kingdom Hearts. Uh, King, Kingdom Hearts has the continuation of Squall's story. Yeah. Because after um, yeah. the events of 8, Squall decides to throw his name away and become uh, Leon based off his last name. Yeah, no. And that's yeah. where you get Leon in King, uh, Kingdom Hearts. So, like, But at the same time, where it's a continuation yeah. of Squall's story, it's a retcon of eight story because Aerith is alive. Yeah. <laughs> you, mean, you mean 7. Yeah, or yeah retcon of 7 story. Seven, sorry. Right. Yeah, um, because yeah. Aerith is alive. It's it's really weird. It's like they just wow. took the fan favorite characters from the games and wow. just them no, in. that's pretty no. Much it was um, it wasn't a retcon. What? They went into the me- middle of uh, Final Fantasy VII is the way I have oh, yeah, because the way I, I guess that, it. I guess that makes sense because like the villain of Seven <clears throat> comes into Kingdom Hearts still, uh, is not beaten. However, the villain of Eight. Yeah. Is defeated and is not brought in, and the, there are, I think, the villain of eight, the villain of eight was a kid, and Squall was older. They like reversed ages, like uh, Squall got yeah. older and Cipher got younger. Would you consider Cipher the main villain of eight? I always considered him just kind no, of no, the, no. The he's rival. just a he's just a he's just an instigator and a long time uh. Like that douchebag in high school, you you couldn't stand and was well, always. But winning. he literally he literally is the douchebag in high school. Balam Garden is a high school. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's not even just figuratively that. He is that. Didn't they have a, another game that came out in relation to Final Fantasy VII that was uh, Vincent as the main character too? Uh, that's not Crisis Core, is it? I know which one you're talking about. It's, uh, like, Dirge Dirge it's like a it's like a first person shooter, Dirge isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah Dirge Dirge of Dirge. Cerberus. Yeah. Yeah, that Dirt was a really weird entry into the uh, series. I was not a fan of it. Yeah, it was it was one of those games that like f- people who were more. So here here's my history with that game. The friends of mine that played it and enjoyed it were the fans who'd never played seven, but only got into the Final Fantasy series through either Kingdom Hearts or the Advent Children movie. The people who like I their... actually enjoyed. So like minimal exposure. You all seen us? You saw you all seen us? Spoonie's review of a Final Fantasy eight and ten and thirteen. Oh God! Well, I have I, not. I have. I'd, I'd be interested to look. Oh into God! That. Oh, it's funny as hell. Yeah, it is that he's completely wrong about it, but yeah, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> he's totally wrong about it. But I think what it's I think the the question though is when we're when we're talking about some of the older Final Fantasies. Oh yeah. Like personally, I don't think that. Like, I don't think that uh, three, like the original three, has held up well. And I don't think the original two has held up well for anybody that's had a chance to play the original versions of those. No. I, I don't even Not think really. You, you also uh, played uh, Parasite Eve. Holds up well. I, need, I still need to play Parasite Eve. I have yet to play it. It's really good. Also, somebody's no, microphone is very far... scratchy. It's like, probably mine. I'm rubbing up against my shirt. Sorry. Why are, why are you doing that, Russ? That's a horrible thing. Are you because sure it's not my one... heavy breathing? Sorry. No, it actually sounds like somebody's taking a fingernail and just kind of like grating the mic randomly. <laughs> yes, sorry. My For some reason, my uh, my mic does not like my shirt whatsoever. So I will mm. try to keep my mic away from it. Can we just talk about how surreal it is that Kingdom Hearts 3 is actually finally, you know, a thing? 
It's it's oh, not God, surreal. Wait. It's not surreal to me because Duke Nukem Forever exists. That's fair. <laughs> Who would have thought that would ever? But... Like what? Like what would be surreal to me? The actual surreal release to me would be if we randomly got StarCraft Ghost. If that happened, I would go. Oh wait. God! Or like a new Turok <laughs> game or something. If if the Turok series survived <laughs> its last entry somehow, that would be. I would be happy and I would be concerned. Because I grew up with the Turok <laughs> series. I don't think any of the Turok games have, have held up well, though. They all look and play horribly now. Yeah, um, like Goldeneye on the 64. Goldeneye Gold has not has held up well whatsoever. No, Goldeneye, any time that somebody's like, hey, do you want to... like the, the idea of the N64 classic has been brought up a few times. And people are like, oh, yes, yeah, sweet. We can get Goldeneye on it. I'm like, I'm not saying Goldeneye is not going to be on it. I'm saying that I'm never going to play it on there. <laughs> Right, because <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, st I still have my N64 hooked up to my TV and my Super NES. I just got into like Super Mario RPG again. I love that game. That is a game that has stood the test of time. Yeah. Honestly, well, and it spawned game, like yeah. the Paper Mario games too. Right? I was gonna say, yes. I think like the first Paper, oh, Mario, paper was Mario is definitely stood the test of time. Pa paper Mario, like luckily, Paper Mario had a a really good stylistic choice that allowed it to stand the test of time. By having all of your character models 2D sprites on a system that could easily render them, and having your environment for the most part stationary, yeah, it really was to its effect or benefit. Yes, by because you because generally speaking, what they did is they had a super stationary environment, and they had they didn't do what uh they didn't do the freaking smearing effect that like Ocarina of Time did with its textures. Yeah, that grossness. Because Ocarina of Time was like, let's take this one square, and this lo looks like grass, and instead of tiling it, we're going to stretch it out. And that is the grass of Hyrule Field. Pretty much. But Miyamoto, why would you take a 16 by 16 square and smear it across Hyrule Field and call it the grass? Now, um, Paper Mario didn't do that, and I think it, it definitely worked out to its benefit. But that does that does bring up the question of Ocarina. Who here thinks that Ocarina, in its original state, no remakes, stands up well? I don't. Um, I do. You I have to play it on an older TV, though. Even was, even yes. playing it on its original hardware, like all hardware is intended. Playing it on a CRT, uh, playing it with the original controller on the original console on its original build. So. That comes with all the benefits of being able to see it with the uh, blurry filter so it doesn't look as bad, but it also comes with all the negatives that that hardware has as well. I'd yeah. still play it. I mean, I, I'd, I'd, uh... I do still play it. <laughs> Playing it's different than whether it stands the test of time. Like, story-wise, yeah, it's very compelling, but when it comes to, like, the mechanics, like, you're aiming... Perfect. That's very, very bad. Like, yeah, on the N64 is yeah. incredibly rough. That's one of the things that the remakes really improved on. If there's, if there's one thing that I think Ocarina of Time did that really, but like, obviously, I mentioned the smearing effect they did for the tiles. Um, that makes things look really bad when you compare them. Like, even if you take an Xbox 360 game in standard definition, just plugging up the uh, the red, the red, white, yellow cables to the back. And playing a game that way, texturing still doesn't look anywhere near as blurry as Ocarina of Times does. And it's using the same hardware, so there's no like HDTV doing this. Um, but what I will say that Ocarina of Time did that really bothers me, one is when you are in the Water Temple, not just the Water Temple mechanically as an area, but when you're in the Water Temple, they didn't realize that having the boots be an item that you had to go to your pause menu to use was a mistake. Yeah, that's a huge, huge mm -hmm. error. Because the original Ocarina of Time has a, has a loading time for the pause menu. It's about a second and a half. And when you're opening up the pause menu, you have to go to that menu each time, equip it, go down, and you're having to equip it and re-equip the, uh, the boots repeatedly throughout the dungeon. Yeah. That's just a freaking design yeah. error to me. Um, yeah, the, other, it, the other thing is the frame weight. Ocarina of Time dips to like the 10 frame a second area a lot, and it's capped out at 20 frames. Right. Just looks Isn't really there another weird. issue with the Water Temple too? Like you can actually get like stuck? No, you can't. You can't actually yeah, get stuck in the that. Water Temple. Um, it looks like you can, but you, you still end up yeah. getting it's, through it. It's that the Water Temple is so confusing that you think that you need another. Because you're talking about the small key issue, right? Where you ran out of small keys. Yeah, I think so. 
yeah, it's what ends up happening is you think that you can't get another small key because the dungeon layout is so is so bad. Um, yeah, but there there are ways to get through it even when you are stuck. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, I, 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 oh, I, I would I love missing the big key. Be, because <laughs> I love Ocarina of Time, just because it's one of the games that I grew up playing from childhood and whatnot. Uh, I would I feel love that to way, say I that that, that way was about Crash. Yeah, I would love to say that that was that was brilliance on them f- to make it seem that way. But I guarantee you, they sat there and just did a shit job with the Water Temple and just was like, fuck it, this is good enough. Well, it was probably also just, uh, I don't think it was that they did a shit job on it. I think they honestly thought they did a good job on the Water Temple. Because what the Water Temple was supposed to do, it was supposed to be the first labyrinth level in the game. Right, because Zelda always had at least one dungeon that was labyrinthine, and that's what the Water Temple was supposed to be. So they they sought out to do that, and they did it, and they did it successfully. The problem is the mechanics they implemented into it were absolutely atrocious. Not to mention, um, I think that they definitely had probably the most boring final boss in the dungeon. You could just sit back and hookshot the boss to death, and it didn't fight yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, that, I will yeah. agree with that. That was... Terrible. That uh, I just I. Mm. I, mean, I know. I think, I think the shining spot of that temple is really the uh, the mini boss takes the cake on that. Dark Link is like a perfect. Mini oh boss. God, yes. Except that Dark Link was programmed badly, because yeah, if you fought right. him with either the Megaton Hammer or Din's Fire, he didn't fight back. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's that's I I'll agree with you there. I know a really good game that's a kind of Zelda like. Like you ever played Okami? No, no, and it, and it just re-released game. for the Switch, so I need to get a copy of it at some point. Yeah, you do. Just it's about it's about a Shinto, Shinto Shinto mythology, and you play the Sun Goddess, and uh, it's it's around yeah. the 200s AD. Oh, yeah, you, cool. you play the Sun Goddess in the form of a wolf. Yeah, I know. I know about the story of it. Um, I everybody that I've talked to that has played it has had a positive opinion on it, and the the consensus that I've heard from the community that's played Akami is that the game was amazing on the PS2 and it was only yeah. improved when they brought it onto the Wii because the, the painting controls yeah, were a yeah. good fit for that kind of game. Dude, you will love it. Um, I'm, I'm, planning love on picking, it. I'm, I'm planning on picking it up for my Switch. Adored that game. My Switch. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sitting here trying to figure out where this thing went. <laughs> the, ending, the ending will have you in tears. Speaking oh, no doubt. Why? Speaking of stuff on the Switch for uh, in Smash Bros and stuff, I'm hyped for that. I'm hyped for that too, but that's a different that's a different discussion. The, the discussion I want to have on that is uh, why in the fuck did we get Piranha Plant as a character instead of literally anything <laughs> else? <laughs> <laughs> Piranha like, Plant is literally a character in this Smash Brothers. Yes. So, oh my god! N- n- oh it was god. Nintendo sitting back. I-, I can imagine the Nintendo the Nintendo design team was sitting there with Sakurai, and they're like, "Sakurai, look, the polls are saying that Waluigi should be the next character. Fans want it. They will pay money for it." And Sakurai goes, "You're right. And if they're going to pay money for it, he should be DLC or not released at all, so they can buy it in the vain hope of ne- of getting Waluigi." Okay, well, what do you suggest? We have one more slot. I'm thinking Piranha Plant. That's the next Mario character that we need. Bowser should have been it. They should have put Bowser in there. (laughs) They should have Gino from Super Mario RPG in one of those games. They should, but I think there's a licensing problem with Gino right now. Oh, um, is he he owned by Square Enix? He's owned by Square, but he's. I think Gino's in a really weird spot because the remake of Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga came out on the uh, on the 3DS, and in the remake, the cameo for Gino that was in the original version was removed. So I'm thinking that there's actually a licensing problem with Gino where they can't use him in things. That's the only reason I can think of that they would have removed him from a remake when his appearance was in like one benign minigame. It seems really strange that they would have had to remove him. I can only conclude that there's a licensing problem. They can't utilize the character. And because the original team that made Mario RPG doesn't exist, that was back when it was just Squaresoft, not Square Enix, they might not even know where the license for it is either. Right. Which would suck. Does anybody know who Gino is besides me and Cirrus? (laughs) (laughs) No. 
No. Clue. No. So in in no, Mario no, RPG, no. in Mario RPG Super, Mar not Mario RPG Super Star Saga. Um, Mario RPG on the Super Nintendo, which is the game that spawned the Mario and Luigi series and the Paper Mario series. Uh, it was the first time a Mario RPG was made, and Nintendo commissioned Square to make it because they were the kings of RPGs at the time. Mm. When they built it, they put in their own character named Gino. The story of the game is basically that the Star Road that Grant's wishes was destroyed, so nobody's wishes can be brought uh, to life anymore. One of the stars comes down, possesses a doll, and that doll becomes Gino. Gino saves your life and then joins your party because he realizes you're on the same mission as him. Basically, in the game, they portray him as a badass. He's like a, a like a caster. He's like a he's uh, a spellcaster with a gun. <laughs> like yeah. his fingers are guns. <laughs> that also, and he's also a a spellcaster that has the strongest attacks in the game. So like he's portrayed as the, he's like the Vincent of uh, of Mario RPG. What Vincent is to Final Fantasy VII, Gino is that to Mario RPG. So he has oh. this like a huge fan following. I would say he's Yo. the Lulu of 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 Mario RPG. <laughs> The Lulu is in League of Legends Lulu or Final Fantasy X Lulu? Final Fantasy X Lulu. So, Gino's got big... Y'all all are going to hate me <laughs> or give me flack for this, but I've never played any of the Final Fantasies. Why Blast are you in this room? You've made, <laughs> why are you here? You've made why some, are you here? You've made some mistakes. Why are you even Russ? here? You, I, have, look, Russ. you have one of these things, right? One of these these phone things? The phones? Yes, I do have a phone thing. You do have a phone? Okay, cool. Yeah. You know what that you know what that phone has? That's really what does cool. It have? There's this really cool thing it has. If you look here, this really cool thing, it's called an emulator. Okay. And on uh -huh. this thing, um, you can get let me go ahead. Most computers have them too. I'm well I know I personally know that Russ spends most of his time in a car on his phone. So and, yes. and this and these emulators he better not be driving. And these emulators no. <laughs> have these things called games. Oh lots my goodness, I did not know games. what emulator was. <laughs> Look at these things. Okay, so in, in the event that uh, you have not played one of the classic Final Fantasies, uh, there is this option you have. Give me just a second here to, uh, to show my point. That is the H section. That's not where I need to be. F, let's see here. You, ha you have to play at least play 7, 8, and 10. Seven, eight, no, at least ten. play four, okay. five, and six. I would say six. Four, five, and six. Is, so, so, all right, so, six, seven, eight, so and many. ten. If, it, if that'll actually focus in, no, no it's, it's not. It, it's not. It, it, it's terrible. Um, and you got a message. The only good thing about that is I don't have to look at your face. Okay, <laughs> better yet, sirs, you have my. We message on Twitter. Just send me a message with the name of the emulator. And I will download that emulator. Okay. And my, my suggestion, this is my, my personal suggestion. Everybody has their own. My personal suggestion, if you want to have a game that is literally the essence of the Final Fantasy series boiled down into one English version of Final Fantasy 3. It's technically Final Fantasy 6, but that's a, that's a complicated story. We don't want to get into that. Play, <laughs> okay. play 3. It is the essence of what makes a Final Fantasy game a Final Fantasy game boiled down into a microcosm. Yeah. And if you want well, to play I mean, a better game than that, that's an RPG, play Chrono Trigger. I agree with that. Chrono Trigger is Chrono a better RPG. Awesome. What, do you make <laughs> of, what do you make of Xenogears? I haven't played Xenogears. The only what games... is Xenogears? I don't has, even know what Xenogears is. I don't know. It has like God, a... Has like a not, it's in a... Some kind of a... Future, it's in the future thousands of years ahead it's of time. A, it's, it's a... With, uh, it's an RPG with mechs. Yeah, with mechs, yes. and it has a not has a not thing to it. Monolith, oh, you know what? I think I've played this game. Monolith Software. Um, I believe Monolith are the ones that make it, right? No, Square Enix. Well, now, Gears, Square Enix. It's Square uh, Soft. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, Square Soft. I thought the Xeno series was want... was all Monolith. Hold on. Speaking of mechs, anybody play Mech Warrior or? Battletech? Neither. I don't know what either Battle of those are. Once. How um, about any fans of uh, Zone of the Enders or Armored Core in here? I heard of Zone of the Enders. Zone of the Enders is an awesome game. Y'all are throwing short, out though. names that I have no idea what they are. How old are you? Metal Gear Solid old. I, 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 am, I am 28. Um, so well, I I'm only 33. Like, you should I'm know 20, some of these I'm games. 26. I should know these <laughs> I should I'm, know these I'm games, a but, um, but I'm because, a older. because um, as a child, I was now. I was uh, 
Xenogears I, since it's oh, one, I don't I see, know many. I see what happened. Okay, so Xenogears was originally published by Square, um, but Monolith Soft is the company that now owns the Xenotaga. Xeno series. Yeah. Well, the Xeno series. It's Xeno. It's Xenogears, Xeno Saga, Xeno Blade. Um, all of that is owned under one umbrella that is Monolith, and they all happen within similar universes with similar themes. I actually, I have a weird opinion on this. I actually enjoyed Xeno Saga, even though it was basically a movie in a game. <laughs> I only ever played Xeno Saga Episode Two. For some reason, that's the one game uh, in the Xeno Saga series that I owned as a kid. I didn't own Episode One. I could never find it. There's a Zone of the Enders and Snatchers, which are mentioned in Metal Gear. So yeah. Zeno, the uh, game uh, that you mentioned, Zeno though, is the game you mentioned. It's pretty much um, a game of cutscenes. <laughs> Yeah. Zeno Saga, yeah. yes. Zeno Saga is yeah. definitely cuts. It's definitely cutscenes. No, cut no heavy towards for that. Yeah, it's Zeno Saga is to it's RPG. Like Twenty and hours Metal Gear is to stealth. <laughs> 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 hey, I like Metal Gear stealthy sections now. Stealthy sections. Yeah, it's a stealth four. game. It's a yeah. stealth game. Well, yeah. It doesn't have stealth well, yeah. sections. It's like saying I really yeah, enjoyed the have, platforming yeah. sections in Mario. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, sp speak speaking of platforms, uh, Cyrus, you mentioned you have a love hate relationship with Spyro the Dragon. Yes. Um. So, what's your problem with Spyro? My problem with Spyro uh, is that it makes like me it. physically nauseous. And he's a purple dragon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it from the graphics or just from overall <laughs> gameplay? The cameras you mentioned. It's the the way the camera the way the camera pan, Pan. uh, pans in the original one. I, I need to play two to see if two fixes yeah. it because I played two as a kid, so my memory of it's really shady. But I recently beat Spyro one again on my other uh, streaming channel, and I constantly got headaches after about two or three hours of play because the way the camera pans in Spyro one, it it makes me feel like I'm getting motion sickness. Yeah, I felt that way kind of with uh, Super Mario, with uh, Mario uh, 64. Mario 64 was the first 3D game I ever played, and it was also the first game to cause me to physically throw up. I've never no played Super Mario 64. I understand. <laughs> I've never had those motion issues. Well, older. Me the, either. The, it's the camera. It doesn't really, it doesn't really hold up that well. Like really? if you play. If you play the DS version, they fixed a lot of that, which is really good. Just having the ability to center the camera behind yourself with the R button was a massive improvement that the DS version fixed. Exactly. Do you, you think uh, Crash Bandicoot aged well? The, yes. The, the, ori yeah. the original? Yes. yes, because yes. with the Insane yeah. Trilogy, all they did was up the graphics. They didn't change the controls or anything. Yeah. They let the game and environments be as they were, and it still yeah. holds up. Well, in my opinion, the original graphics were more uh, ple visually pleasing. Well, fair, because that's supposed to look cartoony and not realistic, and the Insane Trilogy went for the, like, you can see every individual for a realistic setting. Um, yeah. But I, I do think that since both games are basically functionally identical, you can play whichever one you want, and both of them hold up to me. I always enjoyed the pet Crash Bandicoot. Oh, I love Crash games. Bandicoot and Spyro. I feel that way about the uh, the Ratchet and Clank games too. A lot of those hold up pretty well mechanically. Yeah, I've... Ratchet and Clank is another game that I know of, oh, and I I've watched people Ratchet play, but I never got the opportunity to play it myself. It was I didn't one of the... um, uh, Growing up, I was always a Nintendo kid, but when I finally was able to get a discounted PS2, the games that I just went through. Um, religiously were the Ratchet and Clank series. They were just the one reason why I wanted it for myself. <laughs> I still uh, need for, to play that series. He, he also still believe that those who made Crash Bandicoot also made Uncharted. Yeah. Are they really? Yeah, they are. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Naughty Dog. When I started getting into PlayStation games, I think my favorite series was the Legacy of Cain series. Anyone play those? Heard Only of that. Played, like uh, Soul Reaver and yeah, Blood I played on, played on PC. I played on PC. It's like a, it's like Diablo with a vampire, basically. Yeah, but a lot slower and like. Oh, I you have to like go invisible that. and like sneak up behind people and shit. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know him by name, but God, yeah, I played those a long time ago. I played a game that nobody here probably heard of, uh, Jersey Devil. I've, I've, I've heard, of heard of that. I've heard of the Jersey Devil on lore. 
Yeah, I've heard no, of it. There's a, as... there's a game about it that's kind of kind of mimics somewhat Spyro and Crash a little bit. It takes place in Jersey City, of course, but it's uh, it's all cartoony and you know, I'm uh, well, Spyro, yeah, but... Spyro and Crash are very different games though. Like yeah. which one does it mimic more cuz Crash No, is... like you can you collect these um pumpkins like you collect the Wampa fruit on Crash and the gems on Spyro. Yeah, but so like Spyro is a collectathon platformer, whereas Crash is a classic platformer, a point A to point B platformer. Like Spyro, your levels are collect the things to complete the levels. Crash is get from point A to point B to collect to beat the level. Even though there's collectibles in it, like yeah, Jersey Devil's a bit of uh, both. Crash is more straightforward. Spyro is more yeah. Online. Okay. Play Haunting Ground. Gage is asking if we played Haunting Ground on the PS2. I've never played it. I haven't either. Dot Hack. Anybody here play any of those games? I only, wa- I only watched the anime years. growing up. I didn't play the games. There's uh, two separate series with it. Um, the first four games center around a character called Kite, and the second series centers around Haseo. Uh, they remade the Haseo ones recently, which... Those ones honestly didn't need much of an update. They held up well. I, I'm hoping that they'll go back through and remake the original four because like they were they were cell shaded, weren't they? Yeah, cell shading. Yeah, which mean which by default makes it hold up well. Oh yeah, and mechanically the second series held up well, but the first series is very rough to actually play. It, like it's constantly cut in by the fact that you have to go into the menu and select specific skills and everything. So Ugh. Yeah, it's, that, that it sounds very rough. That's kind of like Secret of Mana for the Super NES too. Yes, every single time you have to bring up that freaking ring system to try to find something you need. Yeah, like if you want to like cast a healing spell or like yeah. any spell in the game or switch weapons, you have to bring up that annoying. They and because have... you had three players playing at the same time, it a was like pausing. a lot of pausing or like pausing. you would just sort of like trip over each other. Like you'd all want to cast a spell at the same time or do something, and it would just like slow down the combat. Although, not, like, I love that game. I love the plot and everything. It's just not bad. to mention the extra hardware you needed to actually play three player because the Super Nintendo didn't have three slots. Yeah, had you had to buy the multi tab, which I own actually. I don't necessarily have that issue for me. Ooh, la ti da. <laughs> for me, it just boils down to how many of these I have. Yeah, because my, I I my still run it on my old console. Super NES because I still it still works for some reason. My my Wii is basically my Super NES now because mainly because of this controller because this is literally just the Super NES controller with joysticks. Mm-hmm. Um, I just turned my Wii into my emulation device through the Super Nintendo library on it, uh, and just ended up running with that because to me, that's it's the same controller. There's really not much input lag, and the resolution's the same. And you can change the filters on there to be as close to CRT as you want if you don't have a CRT. So I can play most of the games in their intended form, which is nice. The only problem is that, well, it's a Wii. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up bricking my Wii. I don't know how, but it's, it's bricked. So this is my second Wii. My first one was bricked. My first one uh, bricked itself, and then I installed a new iOS on there because for some reason the Wii's operating system is iOS. I don't know why. Uh, it's because it's running off of freaking yeah. Apple hardware. Um, but I installed the new iOS on there, but the iOS had a different signature. So when I got uh, Resident Evil Dark Side Chronicles 2, Dark Side Chronicles tried to update my system, and it tried to update it with its original signature, which I no longer oh, had. God. So my Wii became a really yeah. nice brick. Oh, would uh, Devil May Cry and yep. Max Payne count as retro? <sighs> it's hard. I wouldn't really call them... <sighs> Technically, they are now. They're several generations old. Yeah, but at the same time, they're not really retro. They're like everything from the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox era is kind of just like the rough draft of what we have today, functionally wise. Do you mean games like Grand Theft Auto and shit like that? Yeah, yeah. like Grand Theft Auto Three. Yeah, like like really outside of improving and adding in uh, new things. What did Grand Theft Auto? Uh, 5 do that Grand Theft Auto 3 wouldn't have been able to do had it been released on a newer console. I don't know, 3, rev- three revolutionized gaming. It did. Like, there's there's no doubt, especially mm-hmm. considering that 1 and 2 were kind of hot garbage. Oh. Yeah, bird's eye view. <laughs> would the original Saints Row be considered retro then? Out of, out of curiosity. A GTA clone? 
Out of curiosity, when did they start putting in the ability to have music in the car in the GTA series? Uh, was that... Was that was as early as the PlayStation, I think, was it not? I was pretty sure it's in the first one that you can have a... Yeah. Oh. I'm pretty sure it's, like, one of the original features, actually. You might have been limited to, like, one or two stations or whatever, but... Yeah, but it's something that's been in the game pretty much universally. Mm. I see. Three three revolutionized gaming. Uh, Vice City brought style to it, and San Andreas blew the doors open. San Andreas blew the doors open in terms of story. Yeah, yeah. and adventure. It blew yeah. something. And everything, <laughs> and all its features you can do. And, and, and but, you can't forget the best feature in San Andreas, the purple dildo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but go back and try and play San Andreas again, and it's very rough around the edges. I can see that. Did... Did anyone ever play Fighting Force on the original PlayStation? I feel like that I recognize the name, but I can't put like my finger on it. I'd have to Google it. Is probably. that like a spiritual sequel to Shining Force, or no? It is. That's uh, what I was thinking. Um, Sirius, I'm gonna end up taking a screenshot of the original um, cover art, and I'll send it to you on Twitter. Okay. But. Um, this is uh, a game that I played at growing up that um, was pretty pretty interesting in my opinion. Okay. Um, it was it was a pretty decent little. What, what genre is it? Because like you can tell me it's, it was it's, a pretty decent game all the time. But that doesn't tell me anything yeah. about it. Uh, it was. Um, it's pretty much. I I, I want to say, oh God, how can I put it? It's not um, like. Street Fighter, but it's not unlike it in a way. It's what you're pretty much doing is you're going through levels and you're just beating the shit out of people. Okay, that's called a beat em up. Okay, that a beat -em -up. genre of game is called a beat em up. That's yeah. your Tekken also. Tekken also had a fighting mode like that. Where yeah, you... that's your uh, Spider Man and Venom Maximum Carnages, your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, your uh, Final Fights, God of War, those... Arkham Asylum. Oh, and, and, uh, and, those, and, those, and those arcade uh, games. So God of War, God of War is a beat 'em up. I don't know if I'd really consider Arkham Asylum a beat 'em up so much as more of an adventure game. What about Spider Man uh, sixty four? Um, Ooh, I love that game. I it would say that one would be classified as a beat 'em up. Yeah, Dang. that's a that's a game that I've heard like. That's a game that I've heard a lot of people want a, a modern remake for. I would oh, it, be really amped to see one. Same here. You know, it was genius uh, what they did for the final boss in that game, where they merged Carnage, Carnage and, and Doc Ock. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that was badass. <laughs> that was the hardest thing that I ever had to do on that game. I sat there and got through it, and then get to Carnage, Doc Ock, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" And then you have to run. And yeah, you it's... can't see where the fuck you're going. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah, like, they... oh my god, you assholes. I, I like it when games do that type of section well. Like, um, there's there's a lot of games that have done that idea, but I think that idea lends itself better to to do two things. Either one, if you're trying to have like a really cinematic moment, because there's even with how old that game is, there's no doubting that if you watch a video of somebody playing that section, it's very cinematic even though it's mm -hmm. old. Um, or you can yeah. use that type of section to ramp up a lot of tension. Because when you have no idea where you're going and you know you're powerless against the thing that's behind you, that's horrifying. Yeah, yeah. that's that's what most horror games have incorporated, especially ones mm -hmm. like Amnesia. They incorporate that entire concept right there. Uh, Silent Hill Shattered Memories did similar as well. They took away yeah. all of your ability to fight back. It's kind of I like those kind of segments in games where you're pressured to move forward. Like uh, the Metroid games are really good at that. Although it's not necessarily like a, a thing that's looming behind you. It's the sense that it's it the was... it's usually the self destruct sequence is what does it. Yeah, in exactly. Metroid games. Although Zachary, you and I were going to come to blows on Twitter about Super Metroid, I believe. Yeah, we were. <laughs> um, I, th I think it holds up pretty well, honestly. So who who here thinks that Super Metroid has has held up very well? Never played it. Never played it. Never played it. God damn! Really? Well, <laughs> I did not agree. How old are you? Pretty well. I'm 26. 
Oh. 22. <laughs> but he doesn't uh, act a day under 40. <laughs> uh, south of 40, north of 20. No, it's that was serious. <laughs> but, I mean, so my, my whole stance on that, right, is like, it's, uh, if you look at like the Metroid games, right, I won't even make the argument that the first Metroid game or the second Metroid game have really held up well because they no. haven't. No, one, one, and, one and two, one feels like a maze with a bad programmer and two suffers from the system it released on. Yeah, that's exactly my, you know, my thoughts there, too. Uh, what makes Super Metroid different is it sets up a very good atmosphere and a good exploration environment. And uh, the mechanics itself, I've never felt limited by it. It comes down to a lot more of how well you can get yourself to use them. Mm. Uh, because they, in they implement like a lot of things that you can do, like neat tricks like the shine sparking and wall jumps. And uh, they made the game incredibly open. Like That's the most notorious sequence breaking game ever made, really. Mm-hmm. Well, I can as, as far as games that are are good for sequence breaking, right? Like I'm I'm talking about the game played on its own merits on what was intended, because a lot of your sequence breaking stuff was not really what was intended. It's just stuff that happened. Like it's almost like collateral damage, right? It's I stuff mean, that happened to happen. Um, I kind of disagree because like there's an area in Crocmire in Super Metroid. So like after you fight the boss Crocmire, mm. uh, you need power bombs to progress, right? Uh, but there's an area that you can get to uh, locked just behind missiles that gives you a power bomb drop that's not the intended power bomb drop. So there's parts in the game where they actually do have item drops that allow you to sequence break. So I feel it's something that they actually intended in the game design. I can I can kind of see that. Um, I think my biggest thing with Super Metroid is that when you take Super Metroid and you juxtapose it to to a lesser extent, Fusion, and to a greater extent, something like Zero Mission. So the three 16-bit Metroids. Yeah, that's... Um, my problem with Super Metroid is that it feels... It feels almost like a rough draft. The jumps feel really floaty, like... Almost uncomfortably floaty. The controls themselves and the sound effects themselves, and even some of the visual effects seems strange like the wave beam how it's though you can almost barely even tell that the wave beam is a thing that you're firing because of the way they have it flash back and forth out of what's the the flicker effect basically they have on it that's what i was thinking of yeah that's the, fair the flicker effect doesn't look very good today obviously that's more of an aesthetic thing there's aesthetic things that it does really well the atmosphere like you said is great anytime that you're playing super metroid if you want to feel isolated you do super metroid makes you feel very isolated my problems with Super Metroid, though, are that even though it's good at some of the game feel things that it's able to do, the controls feel slippery and floaty. And for the type of game that Super Metroid is, I want tight controls. So when I play something like Zero Mission or to, this is an unfair comparison, but AM2R, if you've had a chance to play that. Oh, God, yeah. I'm a huge okay. fan. Of course I've played AM2R. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Um, I won't actually compare to AM2R because that's not an officially licensed Nintendo product. No, it's something made by someone who really understands Metroid games, though. Yes, it yeah. understands Metroid games better than Nintendo themselves, I would argue, in some cases. Like oh, yeah. the fact that they made the spider ball, uh, the morph ball itself, a button instead of a down press so that it's easier to use the spider ball. Yeah, no, they, they understand that way better than Nintendo did. No, I, you oh. know, I think I think I agree with your point about it being floaty because when it comes to like the uh, space jump mechanic, uh, specifically like Super Metroid Space Jump, I think that's the worst iteration of it, honestly. Yes, just the way that the the way that the controls feel, the game feel. Whenever I play it, it feels like a game that I want to love and I want to play it. But to this date, it's one of the only Metroids that I have not been able to go through the entire game because I I get to a point where I just put the controller down and say no. And I have multiple versions of the game. I've played it on <laughs> Super Nintendo, I've played it on emulator, and I've played it on the Wii U re-release of it, all in an effort to go through that game and like it. And I have consecutively failed each time to like it. But I'm a huge Metroid fan. I've played every other Metroid game and liked them. Same. I mean, like, that's the thing. It's like, I've, uh, 
like I, I mentioned on Twitter, uh, I don't really have a nostalgia aspect for the game because like I played it when I was a senior in high school, which was only a few years ago. So mm. that's the first time I played it. So I, but I also played it emulated the first time I played it. And when I went back and I did end up playing it on an SSS, it does, it does feel a bit more awkward. So I'll grant that for sure. The ability to play that game with a joystick helps. It does. The way, the way that the controls are, the, the slippery controls lend themselves to a joystick more than a D-pad. Yeah. So it's. I will say that if you played it on emulator first, that that most certainly does help a little bit because this is a whole lot better for floaty controls than one of these. Would, yeah. would Half Life be considered uh, yeah. retro? Oh, Half Life would absolutely. Yes, yes. I definitely absolutely. Would consider the original Half Life a retro PC right. title. If I can consider something like System Shock a retro PC title, I'll consider Half Life one. <laughs> Uh, hey, I, Sarah, I, did you ever check out the uh, the screenshot I sent you? Uh, let me take a look real quick. Do, 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 do. Fighting Force. That that looks very PlayStation. Yeah. Like, uh, let me see if I can do a screen share for you guys real quick. This is very, very PlayStation. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, absolutely. I don't have any other words for that, but that's very PlayStation. <laughs> Very PlayStation. Oh my very, God. very yeah. PlayStation. <laughs> oh, like, Lordy. Since somebody brought up Half-Life, uh, at least the first game, what did you guys think of the expansion packs like uh, Blue Shift uh, po- and Opposing Force? I still need to go through. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll be honest. I never played the first Half-Life. Uh, I only made my way through Half-Life 2. So. Uh. Half Life One, where, Half-Life where having Gord- Half Life One, where having Gordon Freeman be a mute was not a creative decision. It was just what you did at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas now it's more of a creative decision. Uh, you know, I mean, games- it just ran out well, though. I I think it was a good idea making him a mute. <laughs> well, yeah, certainly having there are some characters that are identified by the fact that they are mutes. Uh, Gordon Freeman right. and or Gordon Freeman and Link come to mind. And Crash. When I think mute, I think Chrono from Chrono Trigger, definitely. Yeah. Chrono is sure. one of the few mutes that has ever made me cry. I like the fact that they yeah. made. I wish they kept Sonic the Hedgehog as a mute. Also, I, uh, Mario in Super Mario RPG is a mute as well. Yes, because he has to he has to actually communicate via sign language in the game, which is good. Uh, well, that's that universe's version of sign language at least yeah where uh, they like act out when he's trying to describe something yeah um yeah crash bandicoot's also a lovable mute i would say though for for max i don't mind sonic as a non-mute because sonic was never really functionally a mute to begin with because if you think about it the the story that they couldn't tell in the games they told through the cartoon mm. so he's he's always kind of been functionally not mute and as soon as they had the ability to give him a voice, they did. Yeah, it's just that there is. So it's just that there is. Uh, I love the Sonic games; they're really amazing. Um, you know, up until uh, recently. But for me, I never really cared too much for the stories in those games, and I never really liked Sonic the Hedgehog as a character. I never thought he held up for anyone who, uh, you know, past your teenage years. But then again, that's just maybe m- my own. Uh, bias working out there. Well, Sonic is basically the '90s as a character. Exactly. That's, that, that's basically what he is, and for that, he's he is probably the worst character in his own series. Any 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 of the Sonic games, I'd say that for voice actors, Eggman is always the one that carries it. Yeah. At, at least once. Yeah. At least once they got the current voice actor for Eggman, because the the one from the Adventure series. Sounded more evil and villainous, but he didn't. He wasn't entertaining. He just was Eggman. Don't forget about Tails and Knuckles. Uh, Tails and Knuckles do not carry those stories. Knuckles was terrible. (laughs) Knuckles was basically Uh, knockoff Sonic. Unlike Sonic, he doesn't chuckle. (laughs) Well, he's way way too edgy for that. Robotnik. (laughs) What? I can never get that. Was it Robotnik or Eggman? Or I mean, okay, so. So it's always been Eggman. Like it canonically it has always been Eggman. But in America, Eggman was not seen as a marketable villain name. 
So he was renamed in America to Robotnik because that was a more marketable name. Not to mention that's a name that actually fits what he does, whereas Eggman just fits what he yeah. looks like. Um, and also, I think that in the in the animated series, like the '90s animated series, I think they call him Robotnik as well as like a derogatory as, as a slur. Robotnik yeah. is the slur for him. By the um, way, Robotnik, yeah. I, I actually want to read something. It's from the uh, gameplay pamphlet that you get. Uh, for Sonic Adventure Battle 2. And uh, this is what it says about his uh, character description. As his name implies, Dr. Eggman is a doctor that looks like an egg. As well as having a feasibly high IQ of 300, Eggman is a romanticist, a feminist, and a self-proclaimed gentleman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? He is, he is nice guy. What? Right? I can't be all those ones. He is, he, Dr. Eggman <laughs> belongs on r slash nice guys. Sadly, his charms are often difficult to spot through his abdom, um, abominable laughter that accompanies his ma uh, maniacal declarations of world domination. I'm a nice guy. It's just that I want to take over the world. The world, yeah. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. He doesn't want to get the world. He just wants in. to. He just wants to make Eggman land. By the way, I'm specifically. <laughs> I'll just uh, copy the link. I'm just trying to see. It, uh, tell me if you guys can see it on the uh, group chat. Yeah, so, so the thing with uh, oh, when Sonic Adventure Two came out, the only type of feminist that existed at that time was the second wave feminist. We didn't have the the Tumblr side of feminism at the time right. yet. So his his functionality as a feminist actually kind of works because Dr. Robotnik, I would see him like philo his philosophy would be one of egalitarianism. He yeah. I can't see Robotnik saying that any one person is better or worse because of their gender. He just thinks that he's better than everybody else. <laughs> well, I think that isn't he like m like your intelligence denotes how like much value you have so yes. like gen gender or sex would not matter it would be your iq would determine it, your value uh, I, mm, actually i said yes at first but then again tails has an iq similar to his and he's always been very very derogatory towards tails um that is true but maybe that's fair, out of jealousy though although to be fair eggman himself did make a did see rouge the bat as a equal partner in sonic adventure battle 2 so uh, I think the deal was he got, you know, world domination and the Chaos Emeralds, where she got the uh, money. Oh, what, what's the name of the giant? The Master Emeralds. Yeah, yeah. His, his whole thing is he didn't need the Master Emerald if he had the Chaos Emeralds, so she could go get it if she wanted. Exactly. Um, if we're gonna talk about woodland creatures saving the world slash galaxy, maybe we should talk about Star Fox then. Oh yes. Yes. Like Star Fox 64 yeah. is like one of my favorite games. That is a retro game that has held up very unreasonably well. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you could remake the whole thing and put it on a modern console. They did. Yeah, for they sure. They did that. Oh, they, they did. Actually, yeah, on the on the 3DS, they remade the entire game with modern graphics and just kept it as the base game and it functioned perfectly fine. Thanks. Wow, there was a wow. Game, there was a like game. even as far as plot, like I don't see any real big issues with it. It was super fun to play, and the the battle mode was pretty cool too. I'd say the battle mode was probably the weakest part of the game, but it didn't. It wasn't bad. It just was the weakest part. Well, like the story was really good, like the story mode. But like I, I loved like my friends and I all loved playing the the battle mode. What? If you ever want to have a laugh though, try a randomizer of Star Fox. It it will have you in tears. <laughs> just the things it does with the graphics. It's Randomizer for Star Fox NES or Star Fox N64? Krismer? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed that. I said a randomizer for Star Fox on the SNES or Star Fox on the N64? I think the SNES one. I'm not sure if there's one for the 64 or not. The, the it, SNES, it, the it, SNES it, game it, just makes you cry in general because it's so freaking difficult. <laughs> Yeah, you know Star Fox. But no, the um, just no, I was thinking of that's pretty good on the GameCube. Sorry, I didn't mean to interject. Wait, which Star Fox on the GameCube? Assault or Adventures? Assault. Okay, thank you. Because <laughs> Adventures is just a really bad Zelda game. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> Alright, great. Talk about Adventures. Yeah. For me, uh, the, my introduction to the series was Ocarina. Um, 
Oh uh, was God. it also for everyone else, or is, is it just me? My, no. my intro was uh, uh, Link to the, the Past original. for the for the Super Nintendo. Link to uh, the Past was me as well. Same. Mine, Mine was, was the original. Uh, I played it way oh, back here. when it was first created. You know what? That's a lie. I played the um, I played the one for the the NES as well. Which uh, one? The first one or the second? Not one? the side scroller. My entry point. Was okay, because the side scroller was actually pretty really good. It was, I mean. A lot of people hated it, but I, I mean, it, it showed that you know it can can be more than just a field um, exploration game. No, yeah, I never, I, I never played the side scroller version of it, uh, or or game it. Sorry, it's I never not, played the side scroller. I wouldn't say Zelda Two's bad, but I I, I refuse to say it's good. It's the odd child of the series. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. like Final Fantasy IX, basically. They should they, they should make a uh, a Link uh, first person shooter. They already have that. It's called Link's Crossbow Training. Oh damn it! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there goes my patent idea. I actually ended up playing Cross Mask before I played Ocarina. That's oh. what happened to me as well. I played so for me, I played Link to the Past growing up, and then for Ocarina of Time, uh, I borrowed. Or not borrowed, I rented Ocarina of Time from a Blockbuster. And you know how with the cartridge games, you would always get the save files from whoever happened to have the game before you, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So my first experience with Ocarina of Time was picking up somebody else's save file and going out into uh, the Market Square in the future and seeing the Redeads and having the Redeads murder me. As a six-year-old <laughs> child, <laughs> that was my that was my introduction to Ocarina of Time. As a result, I was oh too terrified god. to play the game for years. I didn't. Oh play, my god! I didn't play the game properly until I pre-ordered Wind Waker for the GameCube and got sent Ocarina of Time, uh, the GameCube remaster, for free for as a pre-order bonus. When I got right. that, that's when I played through Ocarina of Time properly. But as a as a little kid playing it on the N sixty four. That was my first experience, and it was horrifying. Are those those oh, guys my... that scream? Yes. Yeah. Oh god, those and guys they, were terrifying. And then they, and then they freaking bear hug you from the back and just kill you that way. Yes. Yep. And they like, <laughs> like, sort of like you hand to move. them, and like it goes all slow mo for a second, and they're just mm -hmm. like all like melty faced and like terrifying. Well, it's not even that it goes slow mo. It, they move slow. But they also freeze you at the same time, so you can't move anywhere. You're just like, oh, this is great. I they didn't... now have this creature that's slowly coming towards me, but I also can't move. Yeah, there was it was the worst way for me to be introduced to that game. So, like, technically, I played Majora's first only because I could not bring myself to play Ocarina of Time as a child. <laughs> I, I could never oh. beat Majora's Mask because I lived in a time before... You had walkthroughs. Prima. So... <laughs> Look, I, 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 the way I played through uh, Majora's Mask was through Prima Guide. Prima yeah, Guide. <laughs> yeah, they they totally had guides at that. You time. You totally had yeah, guides. They at, totally yeah, they totally had sure. guides. Oh, okay. Yeah, like one hundred percent. You so. just had to have Google the Googles or not the Googles. What was the like no. big search engine back then? Like uh, no, I had a, I had eBay. Yahoo. <laughs> I had eBay and I bought a Prima guide. I, I remember getting. Well, I didn't have the internet at the time, so I mean, damn. <laughs> oh, remember the days when you didn't have to have the internet to play video games? That was awesome. Yes. Me, yeah, that was and, awesome. For me, it was GameFAQ. I used that uh, whatever, website for walkthroughs. I'm like, sitting here trying to Chrono Trigger. Whenever I had Chrono Trigger, I, 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 I did not piece. have any guide or anything, so I had to guess. You and didn't need a guide for Chrono Trigger, though. That's a very straightforward RPG. Yeah, you, I can see you not knowing where to go with Chrono Trigger. The only time I can see that happening is at the very end of the game when you have the ability to fight Lavos at any point and you want to unlock everybody's final weapons before the fight. That's the one time I can see a guide being useful for that game. I don't like that you can do something wrong and not be able to unlock certain things. You mean like how I've never yeah. once been able to get the scythe for Magus in Chrono Trigger? <laughs> Which because scythe? What's the, the end scythe. slice? The final scythe for Magus that you have to do the uh, the castle segment for, you can lose the ability to get the final scythe if you do things out of order beforehand. Oh, really? Yep. Mm, it's happened yeah, to me in two yeah. playthroughs. 
Like if you well, don't go to Iggy's castle or whatever. Well, you like you can complete Iggy's castle and not get the scythe at the end. Really? Like that's you that's happened Aussies? to me twice. How does that happen? You mean Ozzy's castle? Oh yeah, that's right. It is Ozzy. The Ozzy. Yeah. Sorry, I thought it was. Nah, I'm sorry. You're thinking the Ozzy Koopa. slash and flee. Yeah. No. When you when you go, well, Ozzy flee and slash. I believe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can. Because they're all based on different rock artists. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can fail getting the scythe. I don't know why it does it, but it makes it to where like the chest just simply doesn't spawn at the end. It's happened to me on the original version and in the DS remake, so I know it's not a thing they programmed out. Yeah, one I you have like to get rid of the dark actually. omen before you do it. Mm. You have to take out the dark omen before you do Ozzy's castle. So you have to take out the Dark Omen, not fight Lavos, go back, do Ozzy's castle, and then you get the scythe. Yeah. You mean, the black, I... you mean the black omen, that thing floating in the sky? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. That's because that's, that's it's floating dumb. above Ozzy's castle. That's dumb. <laughs> that is yeah. so dumb. But you have to you have to fight Lavos, then uh, go back through the bucket to the end of time and then go back to Ozzy's castle. <laughs> Because the it gives bucket, you that option. The, the bucket yeah. takes you straight to the Lavos fight. It doesn't give you an option to go anywhere but the Lavos fight, doesn't it? Once you um, fight the exterior of Lavos and get rid of the shell, the little mm. head thing that oh, you go so into you can only, Oh, so you can only feasibly use the uh you can only feasibly use the scythe after you've done like stage one Lavos. Yeah. That's at that it's point. Stupid. That's that's okay. So that explains why I've never gotten the scythe, and that explains why I will probably never get the scythe because I have no want to do that. I have I have this much want, and I have never used that. never used Magus. Magus is never wonderful. used Magus. Uh, Magus is like the most awesome character in that game. If you want to farm enemies quickly, Magus is your man because all of his shit is AOE magic. <laughs> I have no yeah, idea true, what this game but... is. What's your introductions to games? Video games in general? Yeah. Uh, I had a f I used to just hang out at a friend's house, and uh, I never knew much about video games because I grew up... My parents were immigrants into my country, into this country, and what happened was uh, they didn't hear about any previous generation of gaming, so I had to learn from it uh, through the Canadian uh, kids here, and I wanted my own console, and I got an N64. And uh, when I was uh, six in uh, first grade, they always, they had us uh, take these PlayStations uh, home so we could do uh, projects oh, on them. Like, did you have that little was... learning pack? The little learning yeah. pack for the PlayStation? Yeah. No, something like that. I, don't, I barely remember the game, but my first real game I was exposed to was the um, the Space Invaders on the PlayStation. Wow. Which is functionally oh, not that much different from the original. Yeah, except that you can actually so, see the planets are on. <laughs> so the this is original... really showing my so this is the... really showing my age here. But I was introduced to a Tandy eight thousand when I was six years old. <laughs> if you don't know what a Tandy is, it's a small computer <laughs> system that you hook up to a C CRTV and you program your own games in Basic. Okay, so the Dream Reaper is Magus's strongest scythe in Chrono Trigger, and it's not available in the Super Nintendo version. It is only available in the DS version. Oh. So they have in a the PlayStation separate version. So they have a separate one that's or available DS? for that. Cuz the DS version's just a remake of the PlayStation one. Okay, so this is what this yeah. says. The Dream Reaper is Magus's strongest scythe in Chrono Trigger DS and has an attack power oh, yeah, of 180. DS is DS is a special version that was based off the PlayStation version, but then upgraded to have an extra version of a Lavos at the very end of the game that you can fight. It also has an extra ending where the uh, the I believe they have an extra ending where the reptiles become the dominant species. No, that's in the original too. Okay, well, there's an extra that's there's an like extra like ending in the DS version, but I can't remember what that ending's supposed to be then. Uh, the Doom Scythe, the which you version. find in Ozzy's Fort in a hidden yes, chamber, yeah. is the strongest weapon in the SNES and PlayStation version. Gotcha. Yeah, and there's a glitch on it. There's a bug in that one, too. It's hard to get sometimes. Like I said, 
beating the black omen first. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna beat the black omen, I'm gonna be staring the Lavos fight. I'm just not going to go back and do anything else. I'm just going to do the Lavos fight and complete the game. Because you well, don't see, need the stronger I, scythe. I was the type of person that would go to the not to the future, but um to 1999, fight the black omen, steal from a print um what's her name? Queen Zeal. Mm -hmm. I'd steal the um, prism helm from her, beat the black omen in that time, then go back in time to 600, beat the black omen all over again, prism helm. <laughs> I could Repeat. not stand doing the black omen more than once because of how long it is and how many elevator sections there were where you had to just fight the different colored modules. Yeah, I, I, and I went through every single one mm -hmm. to do that. <laughs> I think there's in three different go to the one in the future because Lavos has already destroyed the world and it won't let you into the Black Home and in um, the future. Yeah. All we can so say 1, is that Chrono, Chrono Trigger has a very confusing timeline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it takes place in many ages, doesn't it? Like yes. in uh, the Stone yeah. Age, the medieval era, and the 65 future. 65 billion. More than that, you've got, um, you have present as well, you have medieval, you have <clears> Ice <throat> Age. You have Ice, you have the Ice well, Age, you have the their, Stone their Age. Pre their present was uh, 1,080. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Their medieval time was 600. Their future is, you can go to 1999, which is the day the world was destroyed. You can also Damn, go to 99. It's called yeah. the Day of Lavos. You they can also go to yep. 2300, which is the future where everybody's yeah. starving and nobody sleeps. They've all got yeah, machines that give you They've sleep. got the Enter Enertron or something like that. Enertrons. Enertron. Then you go go all the way back hungry. 65 million years to the dinosaurs. Yep. There, yeah. And then you pick up the character Ayla, Ayla? Yeah, you pick Isla. up Ayla there. And you know what, honestly, Isla's I'm going to send favorite. a I'm going to send a letter to Ken Ham with just Ayla's face that says suck it Ken. <laughs> 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 you know another another no, game. anything that would prove him right because another another game Ken Ham would hate. Bullets. Another game Ken Ham would hate was uh, Far Cry Primal. <laughs> <laughs> right, it takes place uh, four thousand years before the world begins. <sighs> let's 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 like just say 2000. that. Any, but but a game that Ken Ham would love would be Dino Crisis because you have people living alongside dinosaurs. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> are there any games that you guys can recall? Or, or that, are there any games you guys can recall that uh, were developed during the '90s or the '80s, but tried to predict the future in uh, like our present day and what that would be like? Metal Gear Solid. Metal uh, Gear is one. Um, there's another one as well. Hold on, I have it. I have the sequel to it in my Steam library. Does like the game versions of Demolition Man and Judge Dredd count? <laughs> would Fallout count? Because Fallout's pretty close to here. No, but their 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 time their timeline is where society is stuck in the fifties. I yeah. mean, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, well, I, the main I difference say, is that they never developed the semiconductor. It's I would like back to the future consider as um <laughs> back to the future game on the um I think it was Ness or Snets, I can't remember. God, that was a terrible game. <laughs> I will say this, though, for Judge Dredd, they predicted that Sylvester Stallone will still be relevant in our present time, and lo and behold. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't that, uh, wasn't that uh, RoboCop? Judge Dredd. No, no, Judge no, Dredd. Judge Dredd had Sylvester yeah. Stallone as Judge Dredd. Dredd. Yeah. yeah, RoboCop yeah. never had Sylvester Stallone. Really? Terminator for... did, but just as like, oh no, never mind, that was Last Action Hero. No, Terminator was Schwarzenegger. Yeah, and Last no, Action no, no. Hero was also Schwarzenegger. But it had because Arnold Schwarzenegger was in Last Action Hero, they he went to a a movie store and there was a poster for Terminator 2 and instead of Schwarzenegger it was Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester Stallone. <clears throat> Deus Ex. Yeah. Deus Ex is the game I was thinking of. At the time they Yeah, Deus although at the time awesome. Although at the time, uh, Sil Stallone and Schwarzenegger were up for all the same action movie parts, so they'd always be bumping yeah. into each other at the studio. And <laughs> according to Stallone, they hated each other. I bet that anyway, <laughs> because of the rivalry. So some people couldn't tell them apart. 
How could you not well, tell Stallone both... and freaking Arnold How apart? You... There's... Well, well, both their Englishes were pretty bad. <laughs> Although Schwarzenegger at least had the alibi of having that as his second language. <laughs> yeah, Stallone is just that he was living through Rocky too much. This Appar- is... Apparently, <laughs> Stallone was uh, was uh, homeless and like a like well, exotic dancer or something like that, or a porn, yeah, star? a porn star. Yes, he was a porn star, but uh, porn star. He... Yes, he was a porn star, and he wrote the Rocky series, and no one would pick it up because he had one condition. He said <clears> that he wanted to play Rocky, and nobody would pick him up because they wanted somebody else to play Rocky. And then eventually somebody did come along and said, okay, we'll go ahead and cast you as Rocky. And <laughs> You know, there was a big controversy over that, play. too, because they said his story was a ripoff of another boxer's life. Yes, uh, yeah. there was a and boxer that... from Philly who uh, his whole Mariana. entire... Yeah, and he his whole entire uh he fought a actual well known boxer at the time. I think he fought Muhammad Ali. Um I don't remember if it was uh Ali, but he fought another prominent boxer of the time and he held his own. Uh he didn't win, but he did help he did hold his own throughout the uh fight. My dad tells me this story every time we watch Rocky. He's like, uh Sylvester Stallone, <laughs> like at the time could have been in like competitive boxing and like likely like been a top contender. Speaking of boxing, um, does anybody think that the original Mike Tyson's punch out has held up very well? I uh, know. I do not. No, <laughs> no. Uh, everybody just, hate, everybody uh, just hated fighting. him. I'm pretty I, sure I... that the Wii boxing like totally like replaced that as the best boxing game ever. But what about the Mike Tyson's punch out game on the Wii? Fuck that game. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's a good game, though. I, I've, I've never played it, but I think the reason a lot of people didn't like the original Mike Tyson punch out was Mike Tyson as the final boss. He was just <clears throat> heartbeat. You know what's funny? All you had to do, if I'm not mistaken, all you had to do is hit you once and you were normally out for the count. <laughs> hardest, hardest game to beat of all time is like uh, Castlevania, I think, for the Super <sighs> Nintendo. <laughs> Wait, wait, Castlevania 4? Because that one isn't anywhere near as hard as the originals. Oh, I'm, th- yeah, I'm thinking, maybe Castle- I'm thinking of the NES one. The NES one is, like, super hard to beat. I, I, I would I would actually throw for my vote uh, Super the original Super Mario Brothers 2, or as we call it here. Mm, the Lost Levels. Levels. Yes, exactly. I think that Lost Levels would be cool. way harder than Castlevania. Yeah, that game was... I don't know. I don't remember the name of the tester, but the guy who usually tested the Mario games uh, here in North America said it, the lost levels were not fun at all. It was more akin to punishment than it was to uh, to fun, and it was also the graphics were pretty much the same. No, they were the same. Yeah, they the were just Mario lifted Brothers. from the original. They were yeah. the equivalent of a bad mod hack. Well, well, speaking, well speaking that game was actually supposed to be Doki Doki Panic. Well, no, 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 Like yeah. Mario 2, yeah. the good Mario 2, the yeah. one that we know now with the lifting of the vegetables and stuff, that was Doki Panic. The game he's talking about is what we know as Lost Levels was what he considered an unfun piece of garbage. Oh, yeah. I don't so know what you're talking like, about. Miyamoto was going through a very garbage. depressive state at that time, and he was <laughs> not in his right mind. And, and so he, he just said, wanted to punish the players. Everyone else, <laughs> everyone else will feel my pain. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much <laughs> Miyamoto's so does that mean that Miyazaki frame of method acting. But what? <laughs> but <laughs> although it's although it sucks that he went that route because you understand the difficulty with the uh, women than other video gamers stereotypically, at least. You know what? Maybe this was not the room to make that joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 for for me, you kind of broke out, so I had no idea what you oh, said. Never mind. Yeah, you broke out. Oh, speak, speaking of that. old gameplay, you um, tr- you tested yourself on a Bioshock Infinite where they had 1999 mode. Mm. I, I have yet to actually. I have. I have yet to play played, Infinite. But, yeah, I haven't played it. I haven't. Beaten oh, you Infinite, gotta play but it. I have played it. Oh, it's you gotta a play game. it. I haven't beaten it, but I do enjoy playing Infinite. And it's a mind fuck. We own. We own it here. I just. I've. I haven't played it, but I watched my girlfriend play it. Uh, Infinite, Bioshock Infinite. 
Bioshock is the most amazing series ever, and it should really get more attention. And since it doesn't, I'm going to advocate for it. I see she's really yes. fond of it. She yeah, is very I'll fond of it. Bioshock <laughs> Infinite is a great game. Uh, I yeah, it is. Audio. It really is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Pretty sure, Pam, that this is a man's conversation, and you should stay oh. out of it. It is a good oh. thing that she could not hear that. Oh. Oh. Hold on. Oh. Oh. Hold on. That is blue. Hold on. As We're in gonna... blue people? As in, as in, yes, the blue we play League with. Hold on. Blue. As in, like, do I have to bitch slap this gay ass? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Would, ma like would you like to repeat what you said? And if you don't want to repeat what you said, I'm sure anybody in the call could repeat I, it I will do it. I will just do let it. me repeat don't, it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. I'm scared of her. Hey, just uh, oh, hey, search, just let me know if you want me to repeat it. Repeat it. Oh, by the, by the way, Russ, go ahead and repeat oh. it. Oh, hey, so pretty much what he said was, hey, Pam, this is a men's conversation, so you should stay out of it. Really? Because he looks like a bear, but he's definitely a bottom, and I could definitely hit that ass a little harder than he'd enjoy. <laughs> uh, get it, Blue? You're not even a power bottom. Uh, not even a power bottom. <laughs> power bottom. Oh, no. They know my secret. <laughs> so Fallout was mentioned earlier. Uh, anybody play oh, the original first two Fallouts? One and two? No, I hate the original I Fallout. The first. Thank God I've seen, somebody I've seen agrees the gameplay. with me. I think well, the original Fallouts are hot pieces of garbage. They have, well, the thing is, is they have a great story and they have a I great atmosphere. And good oh, you, you know, the, the original Fallout of but fans are, are always are always raging against the new ones, like 3 and 4. But see, here's the thing. Here's the thing with the original Fallouts. I agree with everything that Zachary said. But they play like ass. They have <laughs> they have amazing story yeah. and amazing amazing atmosphere. But at the end of the day, all of those things would be wonderful if they were a book or a movie. Agreed. But they unfortunately, are a video game and play like dick. And yeah. I did, honestly, I've never played it myself. Honestly, but I've you, seen. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. No, after you. I, I was saying I, I I haven't actually played one and two myself, but I've seen the people playing it, and I watch as the characters moves and all this other stuff, and I'm like. Oh my god, that just looks terrible. It just I thought I would like it because it terrible. looks it yeah. to me it I I don't mind playing like RuneScape for instance and it's the same basic combat system. Yeah. So I thought I wouldn't mind it. Oh boy. Did I could have been it? more wrong. Yeah, it's very limiting especially for like having gunplay in it because like if it was just melee i i would probably be more open to it but it's the fact that there's gunplay and uh distance involved in the combat that makes it a lot harder to handle it's like what happens when you say hey let's take uh, a game like shining force and let's make it really bad that's what fallout that's what fallout is to me in its combat system mm. That's that's why like uh, I liked the direction Bethesda took it with like Fallout Three uh, for going to the third per or going to uh, first person and making it a three D world. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why New Vegas I think is actually probably one of the strongest in the series, uh, but it doesn't hold up mechanically. Like if you go and play New Vegas now, you need mods to make it relevant. But again, the atmosphere and the story is awesome. What I liked mm -hmm. about Vegas was a Caesar's lead. The, they're absolutely ruthless. Yeah, I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah, like what that oh, they yeah. modeled off the this uh, post apocalyptic society uh, modeled itself after the Roman uh, Empire or Roman Republic under Julius Caesar. Yeah, C. yeah I mean, basically reenacted it in a post apocalyptic are. world. This is this is uh this is gonna delve into why I'm uh why I like philosophy, but I actually like what first got me started on philosophy sounds dumb as hell, but was uh, New Vegas because like if you listen to Caesar himself in the game and the reasons he gives, the dude is like a huge philosophy buff, basically, and his whole thing was like yeah uh, he purposely set up the Legion because it was so foreign to what was being recreated in the Americas in the Fallout world. It's like just it. Beautiful contrasting, really good storytelling. And, but the thing is, is when you actually also talk to um, Arcane, he sits there and pretty much dogs the shit out of him because he also knows philosophy, and he's like, "Yeah, Caesar is just he's oh, just yeah. completely wrong." I well, mean, like, have we have we ever had anybody in this room disagree with each other on matters of philosophy? 
No, no I think most wall, no most philosophers <laughs> agree with everything. What what got me into philosophy is uh, Metal Gear Solid and two thousand one Space Odyssey. Dude, two thousand one Space Odyssey. I'd say uh, Batman: The Killing mm-hmm. Joke is also another good because uh, oh, the entire like the entire premise of the entire premise of the Killing Joke was just Joker trying to get Commissioner Gordon to agree with his philosophy. Yeah. yeah. That's basically that what that story single, boiled down to. Just really trying to that, break Gordon. So, so. That it takes one <laughs> incredibly bad day right? to fuck you completely up. Yeah. That's a, I've got the entire dark. Oh my god. Metal. How how is the how okay? So the killing not? joke. Oh. The killing joke is very short. If you're going to read, and, and I would argue that the killing joke. So, the killing joke is something that you should read before Dark Knight's Metal. Because the story of Dark Knight's Metal, especially when you get to the story of the Batman who laughs, it plays off of the killing joke so much. You need to read the killing joke first. Yes. Here's here's a question about the killing joke. The panel at the end, I won't go into it because of spoiler. No, actually, I might have it's to. Old. Like, it's old. Uh, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, it's up for grabs at this point. Do you yeah, think Batman actually strangles seconds. Joker at the end of it? Or do you think it's no. just... No? no, I don't think he strangled it, him because within that no. con- within that continuity, that's the event that causes Barbara to become the Oracle, and uh, Barbara being the Oracle in Batman continuity exists alongside the Joker still being alive. Yeah, uh, not only that, but if you um, actually whenever no, you actually think about it, is the entire the entire length of that one comic was about Batman trying to tell the Joker that if they keep going down this route, they will end up, one will kill the other. And so he's trying his hardest to let have the Joker let him help him. And I think and that so he's not it, going to just strangle him at the end because it's, then it goes against everything he just was building up through throughout the entire comic. It's yes. been decades and they haven't killed each other yet. Have they killed oh, each other I mean, multiple times? Um, yes, they, well, in, in certain stories, they have. Yes. I would, I would say though, the idea of Batman and Joker, Joker finally died. having. Well, I think the idea of the Batman and Joker one day having to kill each other plays out best in Dark Knight Returns, because in Dark Knight Returns, it ends with Joker basically going, "You've lost." because he's almost about to die and it's because of the brutalization that Batman gave him. He slammed him against a wall too hard that his neck was almost broken and Joker just basically went congratulations, you've lost and snaps his own and neck. snaps his own neck, yep. What a, right, although I think they did yep. it pretty well, fairly well at least in Batman Beyond. Um, and they do kill off Joker there and it's because Joker killed off Robin. Yes, and well they kill yes. Joker twice because technically they also do it when they fry Tim Drake. <laughs> That yeah. is true. Because yes. I remember, because I, I remember um, when Batman was in the Mobius chair, you know, he basically asked, you know, he what asked was the two questions. Name? Well, first, he, when he's in the Mobius chair, he asked two questions. The first one, of course, being who killed his parents, and then the first one, then the second yeah. one was uh, who the real Joker is. And all you know from that one comic was he ends it by saying, "No, that's not possible." But then they pick it back up later, and what you actually find out is that what the Mobius chair told him was that uh, there's actually three, three Jokers. Jokers. Yes, and that's, was, three, uh, yeah, that's what I was trying yeah. to say. And, that, and that's why in some stories the Joker is physically fit enough to fight Batman one-on-one. In some mm-hmm. stories he's a little more insane. And in some stories he has he, he's basically powerless and tries to copyright fish. <laughs> Yeah, y'all, how'd y'all like Wonder Woman? The the movie, like the movie. Yeah, uh, like I movie? I thought the movie itself was good. I didn't like the Ares character. I thought he wasn't very well cast. I thought it wasn't very well developed. I thought he I looked pref- kind of silly. I'll, I'll be I'll be honest. I actually prefer prefer the DC cartoon. Or animated movies than I do the DC uh, Cinematic Universe. I think I, most, agree, I would agree I with that one hundred percent. People agree with that. I, yeah, I don't oh, think that's a controversial opinion whatsoever. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I I rarely get to talk about comic books online. No, that's the, that's the pretty much the five movies. Much better. I love this really like big divergence from our previous conversation. But that's perfect. Sorry. That's perfectly fine though. I don't mind it diverging. All I have to do is basically change the the name of the video to Nerd Talk or something, and then it's <laughs> yeah. and then it's fine. Um, 
Well, basically, I, well, X Men is known for both, but yeah, we can talk about that. Yes. <laughs> um, although I will say that, thanks to thanks to X Men, I want us to see a Scarlet Witch in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that's as powerful yes. as the Scarlet Witch from the X Men Universe, mm. because in the X Men Universe, Scarlet oh, Witch can do without an Infinity Gauntlet what Thanos needs the Gauntlet to do. Yeah, yeah pretty much. And all, I have and all mutants. Boom. I, I love the prequels. You know, that's another uh, thing about philosophy and how it interacts with nerd culture. Uh, Thanos' philosophy on population control is one uh, which touches upon it. There's actually a, a Reddit subthread uh, called uh, Thanos Was Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanos did nothing wrong. Yeah. Like yeah. Exactly. We, uh, we talk wrong. about stuff like that in my uh, conservation biology class, too, a lot. Like how how can we address like these like world ending problems that humanity faces with like our population and like uh, the loss of of like ecosystems that we re rely on for existence? You know, wouldn't the answer to all of this be just full scale thermonuclear war? Think about it. Think about it. So no, it would have to be like a, it would have to be like a non a non uh, it couldn't destroy the environment. Well, well no, hear hear me out. Hear me out. If full scale thermonuclear war means that there are no more humans to cause any more problems, you get rid of all terrorism, you get rid of world hunger, you get rid of all pedophiles. And you destroy the environment. And there's no environment to preserve anymore, so there's no longer a problem to be addressed. <laughs> well, it's really it would actually be really hard to sterilize the planet. So yeah, as long as we killed off every single human being, away. it would probably be okay. <laughs> uh, but then we have Fallout. Can I, can I quickly add as an aside, if you like year. Thanos did nothing wrong as a subreddit, you would also love uh, that the Empire did nothing wrong as a subreddit. Oh, okay. I actually agree with that thesis. Oh. Um, I think that the Sith were better than the Jedi at managing the Empire. For starters, yes. under the Sith, there was no slavery. <laughs> there was slavery under the Jedi. And what's really fucked up is <laughs> Anakin... And what's really fucked up? Um, they let Anakin uh, go... Um, from they let Anakin go. They left his slave mother behind on the auspices that he could come back for her later, and she ended up dying in slavery. That's the unfortunate thing with uh, if you if you take the Jedi as character like as a Diablo not Diablo as a uh, Dungeons and Dragons alignment, the Jedi are basically lawful good, whereas the Sith are you you can't even really call the Sith evil, right? Sith are more chaotic in nature hey. and self-serving, but not necessarily evil. Oh, but the, I, um, I, I, cha the, I challenge the, that statement that says the Sith did not have slaves. Oh, didn't they? Okay. Yes, I they mean, absolutely did. They enslaved the Wookiees. Oh. Fair. They did enslave. Uh, all they enslaved slaves. a lot of the races except yeah. for humans. Well, we I think they still had human, but they but they had a Homo sapien <clears throat> superiority uh, True. institution. But, um, yeah, but our yeah, but. To be fair, are humans the only people we really care about? <laughs> to be fair, it's the not in a, not in a intergalactic society. The, not the in like Zena. not in the republic. Like, <laughs> like the xenophobia of the empire doesn't it really just kind of boil down to the fact that the original Star Wars movies were cast without without as many uh, with as many alien races that weren't strictly humanoid. Um, maybe they worked that into the story, but like, if you look at the extended universe stuff, it's all anti-alien. And if mm -hmm. you look at how the Imperial officers react to the bounty hunter aliens in uh, the Empire Strikes Back, they they treat them like scum, not just because they're bounty hunters. To Boba. What would y'all vote yeah. the best one? The best Empire Star Wars Strikes movie? Back. Empire. For sure. Empire. Empire. Last me. I go with Jedi. Uh, Return of the Jedi with the Ewoks? Return of the Jedi, the Return no, no, of the no, Jedi not the recent one. Not the recent one. The um, the one in the eighties. Yeah, the yeah, one with the, the Ewoks. The one no, with the Ewoks. No, no, the the new ones just make me like the prequels. The so for me, like, like that shit, the, w just ruin everything. Return of the Jedi would take it, except for the Ewoks. The Ewoks really were a <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically just a bunch of Muppets, <laughs> like. You had the Ewoks the just triumphing the Ewoks a military just, force. <laughs> the Ewoks to me just scream. <laughs> our some of our audience has grown up, but we need to bring kids back in. I sent yeah. a legion <laughs> of my best forces to the planet surf or to the moon surface. They lost to rocks. 
They lost to Spears yeah, and Rocks. In the yeah, a b- bunch of Muppets, basically. But granted, if you look at like the colonial powers, they were getting their asses kicked by the Indians when they first arrived, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. there's, there's uh, you know, different constraints that go into that versus site, uh, like space technology. Well, like, for instance, with the with with the colonials, they didn't have the lay of the land, whereas we were fighting on somebody else's home turf. With the fight against the Ewoks, the planet, the the moon of Endor had already been mapped out. That's they, true. They had a but, full map okay, of but this. The Ewoks the did is, have the still, element of surprise, though. But the thing is, is even with the fact that this uh, the moon of Endor has been mapped out, these specific soldiers may have not have known the layout just as well, because, like, it's one thing to have a map of the moon, but especially like when you're racing on those um, speedsters that they were on the uh, bikes, yeah, they you're w- zigzagging through trees that you have no I fucking idea how uh, these where these trees are gonna are at, mm-hmm. and so it it really is still not it's the they're fighting Ewoks and. This is their home turf, and they know true every but, inch of it. But if we're talking about the Star Wars universe, we know that Stormtrooper armor is made of Duraplast. Right. Duraplast can handle the power of a thrown spear. A thrown spear should not be able to do anything. So the only option that Ewoks would have would be the rocks themselves. Now let's take a look at the rock that the Ewoks actually use. In the movie... The stormtroopers take the same amount of damage from rocks that are this big, that would give you a concussion no matter what armor you're holding, and rocks that are this big. Yep. Right. So what we end up happening is we have Duraplast armor, which can handle rocks this big, uh, being thrown from things this big that don't have a whole lot of muscle mass. They should be able to handle most of it. The only Ewoks that should have been able to do any damage to the Stormtroopers are the ones high in the trees thro- holding the big rocks and letting the rocks fall a good distance. Those should but have been the, the only Ewoks ones. Ewoks also well, ganged up on the Stormtroopers yeah. and beat them, though, with, with mauls. With, and, well, not and mauls. You, I mean, you little, know what? little rock hammers. And they have fur. So <laughs> one single blaster bolt should have turned the entire set of them into a barbecue. Yep, <laughs> and I also just loved like the like, the like traps that the Ewoks set for the ATST walkers. The traps were ingenious. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but what I don't get, you know, the the one trap with like all the logs. Mm-hmm. How the fuck do those little little teddy bears move those <laughs> giant logs in a sufficient a big... amount of time? Yeah. And that's also, exactly. that, there's also another philosophy issue on uh, Clerks where they're debating over whether Empire or Jedi was better. And they were talking about the independent contractors on the Death Star. What about them? The, the independent contractors who had nothing to do with the Empire that died on the Death Star. Um, how do you justify the Republic just they uh, were killing that many uh, innocent lives. They were the building doctrine. a weapon of mass destruction. Where it's called, it's called, well, it's called the doctrine of double effect. Uh, the Saint Thomas Aquinas talks about it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, um, essentially, from an ethical perspective, if you're in a war and you do something like bomb an enemy target, sometimes you're going to have it. Sometimes you're going to hit a civilian accidentally. There's no way to avoid that. Okay, I'll, I'll make another analogy. When Allies took out uh, factories, German factories that were manufacturing ammunition and weapons, there's innocent workers working in those munitions factories. Yeah, the reason, yeah, the reason these things are justified is um, sometimes when you cause something, there isn't just one effect. There are two effects. Uh, as long as the main effect that you intend is meant for good, the side effect that happens as collateral isn't necessarily evil because so it's basically the ends justify the means at that what, point. what no, about the, no, the, the means what, justifying the ends would be doing something which is wrong to get something which is right what about or, the hiroshima or, bomb the, uh, the doctrine of double effect says it's okay to do something which is good or morally neutral even if a side effect uh, what about, that? What about the Hiroshima main, bomb? The Hiroshima bomb is different because it was a, a blatant civilian target, and exactly. it wasn't necessary. I would, like, no. Well, I would just like to clarify that you should look at the fire bombings that were being done, aside from dropping an atomic bomb, and realize that while the atomic bomb uh, was horrific, 
so was the firebombing and in war which side was doing the uh, firebombing uh u.s allies were doing the firebombing to uh, japan because at the time frame most japanese our architecture was wooden based so you could yep. level an entire city with a fire what, bombing. what basically yeah. happened with the bombs was we were we retaliated and when we retaliated we basically threatened them we we was what's funny is that we retaliated because of something they did to us because we embargoed them yep. um, but when we retaliated uh while we were already pushing ahead we basically sat down, and his, History Net can correct me on this, I'm sure, um, basically sat down with their leaders and said, we have a weapon that will cause much more damage if you don't, if you don't you know, call ceasefire. They said, right, right. We, 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 they, hit, they hit us, so we hit them back five times harder. And so we, we dropped the first one, and then we said, we have more where that came from. And they said, we sincerely doubt you have another weapon of that caliber. So we dropped the second bomb, which it just so happened was the only other bomb we had. And they said, okay, we don't want to have that happen to us again. So they didn't call us on the bluff a second time, and that ultimately was where that but ended. But they didn't have well, to use it on a city. Yeah, They and, could oh, have no. used it on a military installation. Yeah. And, well, and mm. not okay, but the thing is... is Nagasaki. But they, w but they wouldn't have given up either. What at if we didn't, they wouldn't have given up. Well, if well, the, major city. I, right. well, even then, if they wouldn't have given up, it would have been, I would argue, better just to continue the war than to do something which was innately evil. But even putting that aside, yeah. maybe yeah. The, well, maybe the thought experiment that's most familiar to all of us is the trolley problem. Um, yes. In the first example, of course, yeah. you have uh, someone flipping the switch <laughs> to. Uh, reroute the train, accidentally killing one person, whereas in the second trolley problem, you're directly pushing a fat man in the trolley, which would stop it. Um, the first case scenario is an instance of doc the doctrine of double effect, because the cause because the cause of saving five people uh, pushing the lever is morally neutral or uh, or even good. It's just that the side one of the side effects, um, the, the second or double effect, is the... Um, a murder that you did not intend to cause nor did you set up to cause in the second scenario you're causing somebody to die in order to obtain a, a, a good from it killing somebody is an errant or murdering someone is innately evil even if it is to save five other people in the second case that's the ends justifying the means in the first and the, case, and the, fu and the fucked up thing is that we started that we cut off their oil oh, oh well that's why i said the the embargo was a thing but also apparently hiroshima was the area that we bombed for Hiroshima was actually considered a military base as well. Oh, yeah, but it, it just happened, it it just happened to kill almost 150,000 people? Well, you have to consider, one, the bomb hit a six-mile radius, or six-square-mile radius, rather, much larger. Um, two, their base structures were set up a lot like ours here. So, for instance, in Florida, there's no difference between a military base and a residential area. A residential area and a military base, the only real difference between the two is whether or not there's an office there with munitions. That's mm. that's really the difference because as somebody who grew up in the military well, family, when you yeah. go to the military bases, they have the same residential zones, they have the same commercial zones. Mm -hmm. They're functionally almost identical, just they had military the offices. Only, yeah, the like, only it, like, you like know, in uh, like in Pripyat. I would also the, you, the only reason why you know that you're on a military base is because as you're traveling through the town and you're going into the military base. There's a gate there that you have to and go. And you have to have a military ID to open the gate. Exactly. Like Chernobyl. Yep. And I would like to clarify that Nagasaki was specifically an industrial complex. So if you're going to be talking about like the bombing of uh, German factories, that's essentially the equivalent of what Nagasaki was. Also, the reason we targeted those areas, because I'm, I'm reading up on it right now, one of the other reasons we targeted those areas specifically was they were some of the few areas we had not firebombed yet. Yep, right. exactly. well, well, a couple of a couple of things though. Any if the intent was to strike at a military base, uh, and they just happen to use an atomic bomb with a you know, you know, such a wide range of self destruction, you could have well, gotten the same proportional damage with a much smaller bomb or weapon. Well, the thing well, is, is the uh, the damage would have been <laughs> the damage would have been a whole lot less if it activated as soon as it hit the ground but it didn't it, it activated, activated while in still air. in air mm -hmm. and but it was so that's why the discussion yeah program to activate in midair though exactly yeah, but if it were to have hit ground instead like say they uh they uh 
something was off about their math, and they it hit ground instead, the uh, devastation would have been a whole lot less. But the fact that it did, their uh, calculations were correct, and it blew up in midair, that's why there's so much damage. And so that's why you get not only the military installation, but also the rest of the entire town. Yeah, we just flew, we just flew out in the weeds here. I mean, as soon as you as soon as you yeah. bring up the the did the empire do anything wrong or did, did Thanos do anything wrong? As soon as you go into that territory, these conversations inevitably come from that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I personally have no I have no problem with that. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit different. It's fiction though. Like like if Thanos could have just have easily made uh, a whole bunch of like arable land on a planet that they could grow food with. One thing, one thing nobody ever looks into whenever you're talking about the Empire is how much money went into making the Death Star. They probably bankrupted the entire Empire on that second one alone. <laughs> Fair. They wouldn't have been able to continue the war that, uh, much past that anyway. And have it built um, within yeah. that short amount of time. But on, think- on whether or not Thanos could have just made more arable land, um, one of the things that I've read up on that is how exponential the growth of populations are. So if you cut a population in half, it grows much. Uh, it grows at a much shorter rate from that point on until it reaches its original size. Whereas if you just double the amount of arable land, the population is going to increase its size to the capacity of that arable land much faster than by just cutting the population in half. But if he has the completed infinity gauntlet, he can shape reality however he wants. Mm, yeah. So what are the... I'm, I'm curious as to what the actual limitations of the infinity gauntlet are in... In the if he can oh, snap his fingers and kill half the universe's population, but, I'm pretty sure there's a pretty high upper limit of that. Well, the reason that I the reason I say the limit, there's two reasons I ask the limit. One is because the Infinity Gauntlet, as shown in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when Thanos snaps, the power of that snap causes the, the Infinity Gauntlet, Gauntlet to look spent. The other reason I bring that up is because spe- it's specific to the cinematic universe. Because in the cinematic universe. The Infinity Gauntlet gets spent, and Thanos has a moral reason for doing what he does, at least to himself. In the comic books, the reason Thanos does the snap is because he wants to fuck Lady Death, and the only thing that he can think of that will cause Lady Death to fuck him is snapping his finger with the Infinity Gauntlet and causing a lot of death. And it's the only way he can think of to court her, which is a lot less justifiable. (laughs) Didn't Death actually um, fuck Lady Death? Yes, yes, it is. But, yeah, no, it has, it, are, are, but why are we just yeah. limiting it to the ability to grow more resources? Why not just snap his fingers and or do something where the population that currently exists would uh, reproduce at half the rate? Maybe they're not fully sterile, but like half sterile. Or why not even just have it where they don't need to consume as much food, oxygen, or whatever atmosphere they need? Well, again, there's, because, there's a lot like, of things that yes, he could have done. Well, yeah, the, I think the like, entire reason in the comics, like like Sarah said, was because he wants to fuck death. Yeah, that's and why I'm that's why I'm limiting yeah. the conversation to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, though. Okay, because yeah. because the, the Thanos from the comics cannot be morally justified. The Thanos from the Cinematic Universe at least has an epistemology about him that we can somewhat humanize him with and somewhat get behind. See, and that's what I don't like about the Cinematic Universe as Thanos is that like he's not the He's not the big bad that everybody like makes him out to be. He's like, he's he's got a point. Well, he's so I I like the cinematic universe version better for a few reasons. One, but you can't the, call him the Mad Titan though. You can't, but you can call him the Mad Titan because the fact that he has, the fact that he has a moral fiber doesn't mean that his moral fiber is good or acceptable. The mere fact that he has an epistemology doesn't mean that his epistemology is something that anybody else can get behind. I think what makes a... Like, for instance, um, take characters that are classically known as insane. You can have a character who's insane, but still human, still somebody who you can you can kind of identify with. When you can identify with that character, it can sometimes make them a little more terrifying because of the entire idea that you're looking at a small reflection of what you could potentially be. The Take original instance, Thanos wasn't that. Yeah. Take, for instance, the Joker in the Killing Joke. Uh, his background story. 
you know, you could really relate to this guy. He's someone who is trying to follow his dream and provide for his family, but he just isn't doing it. Yeah, you, so can't, you can't relate with the Joker, but you can relate with Jack Napier. And exactly. therein lies the problem, because Jack Napier becomes the Joker. Mm-hmm. All right, y'all, I got to go. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hat her, too. <laughs> I'm at work, so I'll be here until, until the bitter end. Well, I'm going to have to hop off here in about 10 minutes because I have the podcast to start uh, oh. on, my, on my main channel because this is this is stream until that because this is on the secondary channel. Right. All right. Goodbye, Adios. gents. Ah, it's been All good right. talking. Right. I'm it's sticking been fun up. talking to you. Yep. Nope. I'll just have to rename what the stream is called. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I haven't finished. I started watching Infinity Wars. Um, whenever I was actually, um, on my honeymoon, we were on the cruise on a cruise ship and they just happened to be playing infinity wars and I didn't get to watch it because fiance, uh, wasn't feeling too good. Mm -hmm. So we went to the room instead. Uh, so that way she can lie down. But, um, I was, uh, all I can remember was certain uh, was the beginning and then, Later on, I go up uh, to the same deck that they were playing the movie on to go and get dinner. And th I ran into a part that I should not have ran into because I'm like, what the fuck is this? I, it made me want to stay, but I was like, no, she. I think she'll be kind of mad if I, if I don't return with dinner. <laughs> so let me go ahead and just go get dinner. Yeah, I can... <clears throat> My, my only issue with Infinity War was that ultimately it's it feels like it's half a movie. Yeah, when, tried when to watch it much in. Yeah, when you watch the entire thing, it yeah. feels like it's half of a movie, and that's well, that's because yeah, they have another like Infinity War longer, coming out. So, I, mean, I understand that they have another Infinity War coming out, but they had another Avengers coming out after the first one, and the first movie still felt complete. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm with you there on that, Sirius. It, it felt like they tried to rush too much into the the uh, the Infinity War movie. Yeah, uh, well, I can I can understand that. Well, I mean, not because I've seen it or anything, but because I understand that what what you're saying. Um, because you can create a two part movie and make the first one feel like a complete movie, and the second one also, but. They must have done something incredibly. I, I they, don't want any spoils because I will watch it. But and to to not spoil it, what they did is they named it Infinity War as if it was the mm -hmm. definitive culmination of the Marvel Universe, and then they made oh. Infinity War Part One. Like for instance, when you go to watch uh, the Harry Potter movies and you watch Deathly Hollows Part One, because of how it's yeah. named, you know what you're getting into. You, you know, know that, that it's going to end abruptly. Yes, you know that you're going to end at the middle of the story. Whereas what happens with Infinity War is when it gets to the middle of the story, when you get to the climax where Thanos snaps, and that's supposed to be like the, the climax where that happens, you're supposed to have where things go down from there. Instead, you just have the movie abruptly end. This would be like if uh, Star Wars Episode Four ended well, after they got the Death Star plans and got Leia back. Because the because episode four feels almost like two movies. You have one set of one set where the movie ramps up, it goes up to the fight with Vader, and then it it pulls back down when they have Leia. It has one climax. Then it has a second climax, which is the battle on the Death Star. Infinity War has that first climax and feels like it should get into that second climax, and then it doesn't. Right. Well, the thing is, is uh, I understand the feeling part of it. Um, I think that I never had my hopes up that uh, about that because because I've been watching the uh, you know what movies are coming out and knew from the very get go that Infinity War was going to be a two parter, and so I automatically am in the mindset that this movie is going to end at a spot where you're like, what the fuck. And, mm -hmm. then, and then you're going to go into the next one. So that may be where I'm at. But I just know that that, uh, that from the very get-go, I already knew way before the movie came out that it was going to be a two-part. And that's fair. And I think going into it knowing what's going to happen is what 
is what changes things. But like in the original in, in the original Infinity War story, after Thanos wins, they win later by having Nebula steal the Infinity Gauntlet from Thanos and reversing everything. And not to spoil what happens in the movie, but in the movie, Nebula is a very prominent character. So the I so people who watch the or read the original comics and then go into the movie, see, oh, Nebula's got focus, and oh, Thanos did his snap. Now we're going to get to the part where Nebula, and then the movie ends. Yep. Like, it, it builds itself yeah. in such a way that even people who knew what the story was originally mm-hmm. still, would get a, <laughs> still would get that. Yeah, pretty much. just me, or did DC kind of try to do the Justice League? The Justice League oh. movie was bad. It was very bad. Okay, so, so I, the thing is, is I'm I've always been a DC fan, and I got so aggravated with them, with how things go came about with their making of Justice League and all the uh, films before that, and probably going to also be their subsequent films. But I wanted Justice League to be great, and. Yeah. I watched it and I was I was let down. To me, yeah. I, I it didn't stop me from enjoying it, but because I am a DC fan, but I was still like, no, this is just why. Just just why. Yeah. It definitely feels like it's like for one, can you even name can you, can you even name the villain from the Justice League movie? Most um, people can't. Isn't it? Uh, I, I forget his name. Damn it! Exactly, you remember. forget his name. That's yes. the problem. Yes, that is the problem. Like, um, who's the villain of the first remember. Avengers Damn. film? Loki. Who's the villain of the second one? Okay. Ultron. Who's the villain of the third one? Thanos. You know how many times I've seen these movies? Once each. You know how many times I've seen the Justice League movie? <laughs> Once. Yeah. Do you know what the name of the villain of the Justice League movie is? God fucking knows. <laughs> <laughs> I know he was pretty accurate. Steppenwolf. Yes, no, it that's Steppenwolf. it, Steppenwolf. It, it was uh, Steppenwolf. Okay, Steppenwolf, yeah. When, when you could have used an iconic villain, like Darkseid, mm-hmm. yeah. and people would have like known. Darkseid. Like, like Darkseid would have been a good option. Uh, Mogul would have been a good option. Mm-hmm. Hell, have a fucking crazy Lobo. Yeah. And that would be fine. But with that said, I'm going to go ahead and end this so that I can get some some food made for everybody before I start the podcast proper. Sounds good. Thanks for having the hangout, yeah. Sears. Yep. I really and, enjoyed it. And I'm sorry that you that we're ending right as you hop back on, Max. I, I know. I just have to attend to something. It happens. All right. Well, hopefully, um, ideally, I should be able to have more discussions like this on the gaming channel because they're discussions that I want to have, but I can't have them on my main channel for obvious reasons because right. that's not the focus of that channel. Um, so hopefully this will be a place where I can do this every so often. I'd be down for it if you're willing to have me again. Same, Same here. And yep. please t- Same here. And, and please touch on the topic of whether or not Griffith did anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, do we really want to <laughs> jump on that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you're muted. I'm still torn by that entire berserk thing. Uh, yeah, you're muted, uh, Sirius. You're muted, Sirius. I'm-